In the matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA097. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Welcome to Doom to Fail with a podcast where we tell you shit. <laughs> Keep it in. <laughs> Keep it in. Welcome to Doom to Fail. The podcast where we are going to call ourselves a comedy show, but we're probably going to make you cry and gross out on this episode in particular. Um, I'm Farz, joined here by Taylor, my co-host. Hi, Taylor. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Um, And we are on to our fourth episode. We launched last week, which was absolutely fantastic. Thank you to everybody who has been listening and commenting and giving feedback and everything else. It's been absolutely tremendous. We're up to the three digits in terms of listeners. So it's a slow roll, but we're getting there. Oh my gosh, Akbars. I'm so excited. I think that I've gotten such good feedback from people. So really excited for everyone who's listened. I know it's hard to listen to a new podcast and like get used to the hosts and all that stuff. So super happy. I wrote down some notes um, that I am sorry for all the ums which I just said an um, and I'm so sorry because there's so many, especially episode two. Also in episode two said South Korea, when I met North Korea and I want to die and I'm mad at you for not telling me that I was wrong. So I need you to be more on top of me. And I also want to note that we're not on Apple Podcasts yet. Is that still the case? We are. We are now? We are now. Sweet. So we're getting there. Things are coming together. And then I also want to talk about the dude from my past who listened to the first one and tried to get me to convert to Christianity. (laughs) <laughs> that was a ridiculous exchange that you sent me. He said, among other things, this man who's been hitting on me my whole for like the past 15 years, this married man, was like, You should read the Bible before you review it. Like saying that, like, you know, I'm being a jerk for talking shit about um about it because I haven't read it. And he su- suggested an app where I could go like verse by verse. And I was like, uh, there's like 200 fantasy books I want to read before I'll consider the Bible. Um, I'm 30 pages into Dune and I have to reread the Harry Potter series and pretend someone else wrote it. So I have a lot to do and life is short. So that's a hard yeah. note for me. Hard and note. That's hilarious. <laughs> I, I hope he hears that your co-host and one of your closest <laughs> friends, I was about to go get an upside down pentagram tattoo like a week ago, but I only did it because I literally went and got like this chest thing done. Like, I just noticed that. Wow. Yeah, I just got that done and was like, maybe I should just chill out on the tattoos for like maybe a few days. <laughs> um, but upside down pentagram tattoo is coming. I already got it placed. I already know the artist, and we are not reading the Bible. We are doing that instead. Yeah, I'm coming back to Austin and getting a matching one. So. Oh yeah. That's the um, plan. Cool. Well, yeah. Thank you to everyone. Please keep so much sending thanks. your feedback, all the good things. And Taylor, do you want to maybe kick us off with what we're drinking today? Yes. So our non-alcoholic drink this morning um, is the physical act of hiding the key to your husband's liquor cabinet during prohibition. So just it's prohibition. You don't want your husband to be drinking. So you're hiding the key to the liquor cabinet. And then our alcoholic drink is a beer called Boddington's from a brewery in Manchester. And you are going to talk about why we're going across the pond. I'll let you start. And we're going to start off with the true crime side of it. Taylor, this is a really bad story. No. This is really bad. That's why, that's why I was thinking to myself that I, I can, we can only barely even refer to ourselves as a comedy podcast at this point because I'm going to go into the details of what's going on here. So I'm going to start at the top by saying this kind of thing should trigger everybody, obviously. But I know that there are some folks who have gone through domestic violence in their personal life. And if it hits particularly hard for you, then I would advocate skipping ahead to your section, Taylor, um, and mm-hmm. just skipping mine entirely this week because it's going to get pretty bad. Um, with that disclaimer out of the way, let's start by going to the subject of today's episode. The two parties to this were Kellyanne Bates and James Patterson Smith. Just to tell you the flavor of what we're getting into, I only heard of this story through our mutually favorite podcast, Last Podcast on the Left. Shout out to those guys. During their episode, Worst Ways to Die. Ooh. That's how this story was surfaced. So, so again, disclaimer, that's what we're getting into today. Oh, yikes. It doesn't ring any bells. Those names don't ring any bells. So 
Okay. Yeah, it'll be I... it'll be fresh for you then. So the story yes. takes place in Manchester, England, which is actually where Boddington is brewed. So there you have it. Um, James, we're going to start off with James, uh, the antagonist of the story, um, who's actually a, a teetotaler, so he wouldn't have had Boddington's anyways. It's a shame because it's a great, great beer if you can find it. James was a complete and utter piece of shit from the very beginning. He was born in 1947, and the events we're describing here transpired in 1996. So remember that detail. Okay. He, he would have been around 49 years old. I'm going to be harping on age a lot. Okay. I feel like after the first episode, I was maybe a little bit ageous, and I'm going to be even more ageous during this episode. <laughs> My sister said, Fars is not going to get away with that shit if you guys get famous. So uh, we were we were laughing about it. So continue. I know. I know. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I have a, I have a, we, we have a few more months of doing this before I have to shape up there. James's history with women can only be described as violent. Every documented relationship he had, he was physically abusive. He was not surprisingly divorced. The grounds of which were domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And that marriage lasted for 10 years, which really goes to show that it can be incredibly difficult for people to leave relationships that are abusive. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, I can't imagine what this woman endured. Given what we're going to learn about James throughout the years, I can only imagine that she experienced what the people that we are about to describe also experienced. Mm hmm I also know, far as that, the most dangerous time to leave a relationship, like a most dangerous time in an abusive relationship is when you're trying to leave. So I'm, it makes it even harder, you know, for people to leave because at that point, you know, that's when the violence really escalates. So, yeah, we are actually going to go into the psychology of that a little bit later because domestic mm -hmm. violence plays such a massive part of this. Um, mm -hmm. So that marriage ends and James has a tendency after that divorce to date much younger than is probably not probably is acceptable the mm -hmm. divorce was in 1980 so he would have been 33 just doing the math on when he was born he would have been 33 years old again i'm harping on his age because for me this is a massive massive red flag i get that most men tend to veer younger in their dating lives but i think a 10 plus year age gap in a couple when the man is already in his 30s is telling Mm -hmm. of something i'm not sure exactly what but i think it is like I'm, I'm 38 i don't know a single lizzo song i watch movies like dunkirk and other biopics i don't like festivals or events where a ton of people are crammed in together if i have to wait in a line i'm usually out so like 20 year old oh, me yeah. don't really recognize 38 year old me so so if i ever tell you taylor that i'm dating a 20 year old i can only imagine it would be because one i'm having a midlife crisis or two for whatever reason I need an incredibly lopsided power dynamic in a relationship. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely the power dynamic. And I think you're right. Like, I have nothing in common with, like, a 24-year-old. So yeah. I can't imagine, you know, having, going on a date with a 24-year-old. And not, I mean, not saying that all 24-year-olds like that, but I feel like for the most part, um, just, you know, it's a big difference. Especially yeah. your 20s, because your 20s is such a volatile time. At this, at my age, I've gone out with several people in their late, late 20s, like 28, 29. And even that feels like a insurmountable gap in terms of like where, what, I, what things I think about versus what they, like it's just not, I don't know. If it works for you, it works for you. But I'm, in this case, it definitely does not work. And we're going to discuss it. I'm going to use this conversation in my second podcast, Dating Fars in Austin, where I speak to all the women that you dated. So. Stay tuned uh, for that. That will be America. very, 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 everybody's excited about that. So going <laughs> back to James, shortly after his divorce, he begins dating a 20-year-old named Tina Watson. She gets pregnant with his child, and she is quoted later on discussing the abuse. She says, and this is a direct quote, at first it was now and again, referring to the abuse, just a little tap. But in the end, it was every day. He would smack me in the face or hit me over the head with an ashtray. He would kick me in the legs or, be or between the legs. Not great stuff. Tina yes. would eventually go uh, get out of that relationship. We don't know much about her whereabouts thereafter or the kid, hopefully, and presumably her and the kid recover and everybody was happy and healthy thereafter. The next relationship that started right after Tina in 1982 was with Wendy Motter's head. Taylor, she was 15 years old. No. Well, I think that that was definitely a sliding, slippery slope that he was on. That's, 
that's a hard no. That one's absolutely wrong. That's not just our opinion. That's an absolute no. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how. We don't have much details in terms of how this relationship came to be. All we know, and uh, one abuse detail that came out in the research of this, that he he attempted to drown her at one point before the yeah. relationship ended. That he, it's that, that's going to be a pattern for some reason. He just really likes to drown. Women, I don't, it's a continuous piece of this. Of, it happened with another relationship that he had too, and the one that we're going to talk to ultimate, about here ultimately. That's actually what happened to her as well. If you look up pictures of him, he actually looks very similar to David Turpin. Like he's Ugh. got the same mop hair that David has, and the mm -hmm. horrible, horrible skin. He's also a teetotaler, and he didn't smoke, which good for him. But in the 1980s, I assume that made him very unusual because I think. Cigarettes were a health <laughs> item, weren't they? I think by the 80s, people were kind of starting to understand that maybe they were bad for you. But in the 50s and 60s, yeah, 100%. Like doctors would be like, I'm smoking while I'm giving you a surgery, you know. But I think maybe by the 80s, it was starting to tear off. But still, I think it was pretty it was popular. Like you could smoke in office buildings in America until like the late 90s. So yeah. I think that it was probably still pretty popular. And, and smoking knows, is delicious and awesome. So, unfortunately, that is also true. Yeah. And who knows what was going on in Manchester, England? Whether they, you know, I would have, I don't know, maybe they're ahead of us, maybe they're not. But, but also, look, I understand if you're sober because you have a drinking problem. But this is Manchester in the 1980s. I can imagine the pub life had to be awesome to be able to go out and like have a drink with friends and throw darts. I keep going back to um, that movie. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm losing it. American werewolf in London. Yes. Do you remember that the bar scene before he's attacked by the werewolf? Yes. That's what I imagine yes. these pubs are like. That you can just go in and everybody knows you, and it had to be. It would have been fun, but this guy didn't take part in that. Apparently, he could have still gone. You know. I, guess, I, don't, I, I, guess. I don't know. 1980s. If you order water at the bar, that's kind of a. Yeah, I don't know. It's an it's an interesting thing to be like. I'm in England in the 80s and you know being a little bit different I also the one thing I was wondering is like how many men are in Manchester is it two because I feel like these women can do better yeah I don't know I actually don't even know what the population of Manchester is but I mean I've heard of it like we all heard of Manchester United we know that it's a of course. relatively of course. populous populous area but um anyways fast forwarding a little bit um 11 years from Wendy to 1993 so that relation with Wendy ended, the 15 year old ended in 82. And we're now we're in 1993. And this begins the start of his interactions with Kelly and Bates. Taylor, Kelly is 14 years old when they meet. No, and he's just getting older. He's so, just getting older. That's all yeah. right. Yeah, she was a babysitter for a friend of James's. God, and then, babysitter is so dangerous. So yeah. Weird. Yeah, the next two years of them knowing each other isn't actually very well documented. All we know is that they struck up enough of a relationship over those two years so that when Kelly turned 16, she moved in with James at his house. Okay. That's all we know. She's 16. This puts him at 46 years old. Okay, that's gross. I'm going to look up age of consent in the UK. Age of consent in the UK. I'm going to get arrested if we even look this up. Yeah, go incognito. Um, it's 16. Yeah, that makes sense. I was wondering why they harped specifically on the point that she turned 16 and that was like a thing. That's so I guess that why. makes sense. Yeah. That, yeah. Kelly, Kelly actually seemed to have good parents in this situation. They tried to get her out of this. I don't recall what it was like being this age, but I'd imagine the rebellious spirit of a 16 year old. If your parents tell you not to do something, you probably t try to do, try to do it more, right? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. And we've talked about, you know, at 16, she could be dating this 46 year old, or she could be emperor of Rome. It's a very up and it's, you know, whatever. Yeah. Who knows what you're like when you're 16? No one can remember. I didn't. I didn't put this in the outline, but there's a story I read where the way she was introduced, the mom was introduced to James was. Kelly brought him to their house and they were in the kitchen and the mom walks in and she looks at this fucking 46 year old ghoul. And she said that her first 
inclination was to grab the knife that was on the counter to her right and just start stabbing him. Oh my god. Yeah. Which, look, that's a pretty ex- extreme thing to think. But you're looking at your 16-year-old daughter and this near 50-year-old man. I mean, I can, um, you know, you, one can only imagine what, what, would, what would come of that. So at this time, Kelly's parents didn't explicitly know about the age difference. It was just based on looking at him that they made the assumption that he was dramatically older. Right, he's clearly not a, a, another teen. Exactly, exactly. You know. Kelly's mom would say when she first met James, this is a quote, as soon as I saw Smith, the hairs on the back of my neck went up. I tried everything I could to get Kellyanne away from him. You know, she tried. They really tried. They really did their best to try and, you know, get this guy out of her life, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. Kelly would move out because of the nonstop arguments, but moved back in with him in November of 1995. Again, I don't know the ins and outs of the domestic violence, but Kelly's behavior around this time seems like it was emblematic of someone enduring a lot. There's things that she was doing and there were indicators. So for example, she would have visible bruises. She became very withdrawn, according Mm -hmm. to people. She quit her job for seemingly no reason. Mm -hmm. And this to me is really the saddest part of reading stories about this. I just hate it when someone takes the light out of someone else's eyes. It's yeah. one of the worst things you could do to someone. Just getting pleasure out of them being someone that loves you being sad. I don't, I don't know if that's fixable or not, but it really is one of my, the worst qualities of, of being in situations like this is having someone take that away from you. Totally. And taking away like the things that you enjoy until they control everything. Like little yeah. by little. Yeah. Yeah. And also, remember the power dynamic, 46 to 16. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I imagine he's like, if not the same age as her parents, that he's older as well. Yeah, 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 probably. Yeah, it's actually a really good point. In March of 1996, she apparently sent her parents a card for their anniversary and for a birthday, but the handwriting was that of James and not Kelly. Uh, Yeah, people at this point are increasingly worried about her well-being. Her brother tried visiting and was told by James that she wasn't home. She probably was because abusers just don't like their victims to be out of their sight. Right. And a neighbor came by and asked about her well-being. And apparently, James told her to go stand in an upstairs window so that the neighbor could see her. Yeah. He was, he was, he controlled her every movement. He controlled her everything. Yeah, it's horrifying. You know, I was thinking about this. I could be dead for months and my neighbors would never know. I just don't have that kind of relationship with my neighbors. And so to me, it sounded like Kelly was an outgoing person that people cared about, you know? Right. And expected her to like be outside and say hi yeah. to people, but she wasn't. Yeah. yeah. So one, one month after this, this all, that was March of 96. In April of 1996, James goes to the police and to- tells them that he accidentally killed his girlfriend during an argument, claiming that she had drowned. And she, he had tried resuscitating her, but it didn't work. Ugh. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. Weird to... Why did he go to the police? Now I'm like, why did he go to the police? Why didn't he just, like, leave? Or Yeah, yeah because, he, because he already, like, brushed off everybody else's concerns, right? He already brushed off the... Con- like, the brother shows up. Oh, she's not home. Uh, right. You know, like, it, is, it is an unusual move. Although, I, although if I dwell on it a little bit, I can I can imagine that as an abuser, you probably think like she deserved it. Everybody's gonna understand my point of view, you know. Mm-hmm. So police go to the house and they find Kelly naked in the bedroom, and this is where things get horrible. So again, skip past yeah, this if, if you have a particular trigger for gratuitous violence. Police found her blood throughout the entire house. This is a, this wasn't a single explosion of violence like it was with Tony Tote last week. Mm-hmm. This was incredibly protracted and deliberate. It was a torture session, essentially. Yeah, and there's no blood involved in drowning. Yeah. So <laughs> so think. so interesting fact: she actually died of drowning. Well, yeah, totally. But like, also, that's crazy. There's blood everywhere. So obviously, the other stuff was happening. It wasn't like. Yeah. She accidentally drowned and nothing else had been wrong. Right? Yeah, th- yeah no, that's 100%. 100%. Oh, God, poor baby. So during the last month of her life, so this is the, the March to April time frame, she'd been kept bound to 
a radiator or to furniture by her hair or by ligature around her neck. Oh my God. That's the thing. It's a month. That's why that, this is why it went on the list of worst ways to die. So I have all the injuries written down here and I almost don't even want to go through them because no. it's terrible. It's just awful to think anybody endured this. Basically a kid, a child endured this. The list of injuries for a body just sound like James was essentially possessed. Mm-hmm. Taylor, is it fair to say we don't really need to go into all the details here? Yeah, I think that's okay. You can look it up if you really are curious. Kelly Ann Bates, the, the details are out there. I don't really feel like it's going to help anyone to actually talk about this, but we are going to yeah. talk about we are, we are going to talk about one of the injuries because it's pertinent to what how long this experience dragged on for. The one injury that I will bring up is both of her eyes were gouged out. Oh, no. <gasps> oh. The, the reason that detail is relevant is because the pathologist, a man named William Lawler, who examined her body after they, she was found, said that the eyes were removed, quote, not less than five days and not more than three weeks before her death. Oh. So, she, so this injury happened... And she just lived for possibly weeks. Oh my God, that's terrible. That yeah. is so scary. And that is so awful. Yeah. The pathologist also stated, quote, in my career, I've examined almost 600 victims of homicide, but I've never come across injuries so extensive. Oh. Yeah. That's awful. She was obviously starved. She was obviously malnourished. And like I said before, she did die of drowning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So despite all the other shit that James said, he was telling the truth about how she ultimately passed. Right. She's just in so much pain. I mean, it's not like. Would you even fight? I mean, I feel like you wouldn't even fight back at that point, right? Like, I mean, I don't think you would because all, all the, I mean, all the emotional abuse, what she's going to do? Like he's a grown man and she's a child. And yeah. if, she, if she's tied to something, then. I mean, there's no, I don't know, there's, I don't think fighting back is even, like, a thing that could be possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. And, you know, Ugh. there was a part of this case that struck me, especially during the trial portion of it. Again, we don't have a ton of details about the inner workings of the relationship, but I would imagine that gaslighting was a huge part of the mm -hmm. relationship. Because during the trial, James was quoted as saying, she would put me through hell winding me up. Like, right. It's, it's her it's fault. Like, it's her fault. Yeah. Absolutely not. And look, I, I intrinsically know what gaslighting is, but I, no matter what, I went and looked it up on Wikipedia anyways. And the way it's described is, the, is manipulating someone so as to make them question their own reality, mm -hmm. which I feel goes part and parcel with an abusive relationship. Have you seen, you know, it comes from a movie. Have you seen the movie? I haven't seen the movie. And I it, don't know what the connection is to that movie. Like, it's literally, that's where the term comes from. It's called Gaslight. It's about a husband who is trying to make his wife think she's crazy. So he keeps lowering the flame on the lights in the house because it was, like, before electricity and telling her that she's crazy because she thinks it, it's getting darker. That's the entire plot of the movie? Yeah, and that's where the term gaslighting comes from. Wow, okay. Learn something new every day. So I kept reading more about gaslighting um, and found this part to be telling. This is a quote I'm going to read from the Wikipedia article on gaslighting. Mm -hmm. Those being gaslighted must learn that they don't need others to validate their reality and they need to gain self-reliance and confidence in defining their own reality. I think that's a tough part when you're in an abusive relationship, especially with an insanely lopsided power dynamic is how do you zoom out and gain the self-awareness and confidence that yeah. what you're experiencing is real versus what your partner is telling you? I mean, that'd be hard at any age, much less at 16. Absolutely. And totally isolated as well. You're yeah. Just trapped in this house. Yeah. hundred percent. So back to the trial. During the trial, he said that Kelly had dared him to blind and stab her again. <laughs> bullshit. Right. Yeah. Bullshit. Or it's like, I don't know, like, I don't think it's, like, a fun dare. <laughs> like, that's not how that's happening. Yeah. No. A court psychiatrist that examined James said that he had um, severe paranoid disorder with morbid jealousy and lived in a distorted reality. Again, going back mm -hmm. to the gaslighting concept. 
I went down another rabbit hole on what morbid jealousy means. Mm -hmm. It's also called pathological jealousy, delusional jealousy, or my favorite, and probably yours as well, Taylor, a fellow syndrome. So you had, yeah, you had mentioned this at the top, which was the most, I think you said the most dangerous time for someone to leave an abusive relationship. Sorry, can you restate that? Yeah, the most dangerous time in an abusive relationship is when you are trying to leave. So all of the abuse escalates when the partner knows that you are trying actively to get out of their relationship. Yeah, so that ties to this. Because, I mean, if you know Othello, the the Shakespeare play, then you know where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. This is a situation, morbid jealousy is a situation where a person is consumed by thoughts that their partner is unfaithful without any evidence to indicate this. Mm -hmm. But it's different between men and women. So for men, predictably, the obsession they have is with sexual infidelity. Mm -hmm. And for women, the obsession is over emotional infidelity. Totally. In a lot of these situations, it ends how you would presume it would end. It would end, it ends in murder, suicide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which kind of, you know, again, that makes sense why it's called the fellow syndrome. So, so that's, the situation that we had here with James and Kelly, which is, is an extreme example, Mm -hmm. but I would assume a fairly common example of a situation where someone's in an abusive relationship. When I was in law school, I knew somebody that I was in class with who, when we were in our last year before we were going to graduate, she was breaking up with her boyfriend in her car and the boyfriend shot her in the face in the car killing her and then killed himself yeah oh far i'm so sorry that's awful yeah it it, you know i hadn't thought of that moment very much until i started researching this case and i saw Mm -hmm. this abello syndrome being listed here i was like oh my god i remember that um yeah there's there's tons of people in manchester there's five hundred thousand people there you know like just date someone else yeah don't kill people there's no reason Obviously. Yeah, it's, I don't mean to say that. There's no reason to kill people, but like, just date someone else. There's tons of people. So you know, I'm reflecting back on my that 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 law school experience, mm-hmm. and it's when it's the man doing it, which it almost always is the man doing it. Mm-hmm. It's usually because the woman is like living her best life, and yeah, he's and he's being left behind. Totally, you know? exactly. I mean, she was going to graduate and presumably be like a very successful lawyer, and he was kind of a nobody. And and she didn't had, need him. Yeah, she didn't need him, and he he had peaked with her, and he knew that. You know, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I don't know. It's that's it's, it's really that's true. Like, yeah, that does. Yeah, that's interesting. Like, she's the best he could ever hope to date, and so he's like, I can't. I don't know. I can't do any better. So you have to, oh, ugh, I have no, I have no ras- rationalization behind that, but. Yeah, guys, if, if you're, if you're in that situation, make yourself better. <laughs> learn, <laughs> yeah, learn, be learn, better. Yeah, like learn. Go to law school, instrument. you idiot. Yeah, yeah go, go to school, like, learn an instrument, like learn how to do something cool, like work with, with your, like don't hurt people because they're better than you. Make yourself better so you deserve someone better. Um, that is such good, that is such good advice. Good job. Thank you. Every now and then. you. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna little, bring that up in dating fires in Austin. Little nuggets of wisdom. Um, so at the trial, they obviously found James to be guilty and he is sentenced to life imprisonment. The jury was offered counseling to deal with having to look at pictures of Kelly's injuries. Oh my god, body. poor people. That's awful. Uh, apparently, every single one of them took the court up on that. Oh, ugh. Yeah. Well, that was nice of them, I guess. God, that's terrifying. That's a terrifying thing that you don't even think about being on a jury is how traumatic it could be if you're like looking at these, listening to Taylor, these horrible stories. Back on the law school thing, I don't know if I told you this, but I worked in um, death penalty defense work. So I worked mm. for a law firm that defended people who were subject to the death penalty in Florida. Mm-hmm. The pictures I saw. Oh my God fucking nightmare fuel oh my gosh what these no. people did to people i yeah. imagine oh my god i'm sorry that you went through that 
yeah, this is terrible. Up. I feel terrible. It's eight. It's like nine in the morning. I feel awful. Keep going. Great, great way to start start the day, start your Saturday. <laughs> so let's see. Um, James had his first parole hearing recently. This is incredible. Oh he had a parole hearing in November of 2022. So like fairly recently, he was denied parole. He was obviously he's obviously still in prison to this day. He's now 74 years old. They described the conditions in which he lived as closed conditions, which mm-hmm. sounds like solitary confinement to me. I mean, he yeah. murdered a child. I mean, he's not going to do well. And tortured and, yeah. yeah, he's not going to do well. He's not a tough guy prison person, you know, so he's not going to do right. well. So I think that they probably, for his own safety, if nothing else, keep him isolated from the rest of the population. And that's where You're he lives. An and asshole. Hopefully that's where he dies. Um, yeah, awful, awful story. Again, the list of shit that this girl went through, there was 150 separate injuries to her body. Mm. Not, if you want to know, go look up the details, but it was a, it was an awful, awful experience. And if you are ever in a situation that is veering towards violence, mm-hmm. find your support system and hold on to your support system, your family, your friends, and do your best to, to get out of it. I'm going to put some, resources in our notes um i know there's some places that you can go to where like you can erase your browser history so so, so someone if you're worried that someone's checking that for you and things like that so you can get help kind of anonymously without your your abusive partner knowing um how how was she drowned like in the bathtub yeah in the bathtub oh poor kid poor thing yeah he apparently drowned her in the bathtub then took her body and put it in the bedroom Ugh. Yeah, Man, I, I feel. I don't know what he thought would happen when police was. Her eyes were missing. Right, it's not. That's not like, all the blood everywhere. It's not like she accidentally drowned in the bathtub and everything else is perfectly fine. Like there's blood everywhere. Her eyes are missing. She's obviously been tortured for a really long time. But oops, I killed her. Yeah, it was just like a fun and game. It's like that's not fun and games. And I almost feel like we're lucky that he did that because he didn't do it again that he was abusive but at least he only killed one person because he definitely would have killed another person i would imagine as we we're discussing earlier when someone's life is going one direction and the man feels like they're being left behind the fact that the abuse escalated from like him punching and kicking the wendy girl earlier on when he was like younger mm-hmm. or earlier on in the in the timeline Maybe because he, he was approaching his 50s, he went over the hill from 40s, and maybe he just realized, like, this is the end. Like, life is, I'm never going to get anyone as young and whatever as, as he thought Kelly was. And mm-hmm. that was kind of the impetus for, that's her graduating law school moment, essentially, oh, is, is like, that, that's the best I'm ever going to do from here on out. And I wonder what he is thinking. Like, he's, now he has been in jail for 30 years, you know? So... It's not like his life ended, his life continued, but I guess he just, I don't know, now he has, now he has zero girlfriends. So, fuck yeah. you. Yeah, fuck wow, him. What, what, fuck what James. Piece of shit. Total piece of shit. Hope he rots in fucking misery in jail for the rest of his life. But that's our story. And like Taylor said, we'll, we'll put resources in the show notes if you're in a situation that you think you should extricate yourself from. So, we'll move on to... A probably incredibly upbeat, uplifting, happy, joyous tale that Taylor's going to tell us. Right, Taylor? That's right. So I was thinking maybe someday that we should like video record these and put them on YouTube because people really like that. But I'm like, my face is 50% like terrible frown and 50% like shock. And then also I'm like out of frame because I'm like crying. So I don't know if if I'm ready for that yet because I do not make good faces during this podcast because I'm like about to die. So... That was I mean, terrible. To be, to be fair, sure. we're recording this on Zoom, so we could do that at some point. So we'll... I know, and I, I think that we should, but I need to work on my my resting terrible story face. I'm going to work fair. on that, and then we'll do it. Fair enough. So, so, okay, well, let's switch over to our historical story of a relationship that was doomed to fail. And as far as this is, this is a love story. I texted you last night that I was crying and reading and drinking whiskey. And I was listening to the, 
the last book that I listened on this. I have this pile of books. This is this should be in our visual medium. I'll put this picture. I have this huge pile of books, these books that I've read kind of on um, these women in the story. And I finished the last one last night via audiobook while I was doing the laundry. And I just sat on my bed just like sobbing because it's just, I feel very like, emotional towards towards these people. And so it's a love story. It's complicated. There's so much more that can be told than what I'm about to tell you right now, but I'm gonna tell you sort of the the cliff notes of this of this story. And I'm gonna tell you the red flags right at the beginning. So that that were telling us that this relationship was never gonna last and never gonna be a forever relationship. So the two biggest red flags is one person in the relationship is the wife of the president of the United States. She's the first lady. And the other person is the woman reporter assigned to cover her. So it was never going to work out. They were, you know, um, both women in the 1940s and one of them was the first lady. So wow. there was a lot of, you know, probably not going to make it. But in the meantime, a lot of stuff happened. Wow. So a huge pile of books that's taken me years to read through. I want to read a couple, tell you what a couple of them are. There's No Ordinary Time by Doris Kearns Goodwin, who's my favorite historian. There's Eleanor Roosevelt Volumes 1 through 3 by Blanche Wieson, Wieson Cook. There's Eleanor and Hick by Susan Quinn. Eleanor and Franklin by Joe Lash. And then Eleanor's book herself, This I Remember, that she wrote in 1945. And I wanted to do a shout out to Aaron Montijo at Diamond Sutra Books in Las Vegas. He's been a friend of mine since eighth grade and he owns a bookstore in the art district in Las Vegas. And he found me a first edition of Eleanor's book. So That's it's really cool. beautiful. And I'm super excited that I have it. It's very special. So thank you, Aaron. And if you're in Las Vegas, go to Diamond Sutra Books. It's in the arts district. So there are thousands of books written about the Roosevelt's talking Franklin Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, 1940s, World War II America, it's the New Deal. Um, there's thousands of letters that Eleanor wrote. She would write constantly, be, be writing letters to people. She also wrote tons of articles, tons of books. So this is just like a tiny piece in the Roosevelt's puzzle of the story. I'm also already like pre-upset that I'm not going to get to every detail and I'm going to miss things in this story. So I just want to encourage people to uh, DM me at doomed to fail pod on Instagram and tell me what I missed. And I want to talk more about it. And I'm also not a queer historian. Like I don't, this isn't, and I'm not a historian. This isn't my expertise at all. So I also want to make sure, like, I'm happy that your story was in England. I want to, you know, diversify, go all over the world. And I'm not, I don't want to talk about white people. So definitely let me know if you have any other ideas, um, you far as, and the world. So I'd love to learn a little bit more and have some suggestions on other relationships I could cover. Taylor, can I interrupt real quick? Uh-huh, please do. I, I mean, I've known you a very long time. <clears throat> and the story you're going to tell us about Eleanor Roosevelt feels like it has been on your mind a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious why that is. Or if the story you're about to tell is going to highlight that for us anyways, then we can just forget this part and move on but it's been living in your head for so long I know no you're totally right like I'm looking around I'm like oh I have a painting of Eleanor on my wall you know I definitely like have I've read all these books about her I feel very like just continue to be interested with her I would read all those books again I was reading Doris Kearns Goodwin because she is a really good you know historian she wrote the team of rivals, the Abraham Lincoln one that everybody knows about. She wrote a really great one on leadership in turbulent times about like Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt and Lyndon Johnson. And I like her books a lot. And so I was reading those and then I read No Ordinary Time about Eleanor and Franklin. And then I was at my in-laws house and I found Eleanor Roosevelt volume one. And that is what actually our friend Lindsay told me to read because she knew I was reading another one about Eleanor. So I found that and I've been kind of like working my way through that three volume set. And it's just like, I'll talk a little bit about her life, but it's just, and this is also something that I read in another book, oh my God, about Winston Churchill. I've just decided to become a historian in the past couple of years. I don't know, it was a pandemic, I had nothing to do. So, I mean, I had a lot to do, but I decided to also do this. And there's a book about Winston Churchill and the way that she, that book opens is like, I'm interested in people who live a full life, 
like people who mm-hmm. really fucking just live the shit out of their lives, you know, and they took opportunities and there were ups and downs, but you can really look at their story and be like, yeah, they fucking live their, their whole life and they live the shit out of it. So I think that Eleanor definitely did that. And that I think is really fascinating and something that like, I don't want to be like, you know, step by step in everything that she did. But I think that the idea of like living your life to the fullest is really powerful because a lot of people feel like they're not. I love sense? that. Yeah, makes sense. Oh, okay. I have a bag of tissues. I'm already going to cry. This makes no sense. So, the relationship between Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt is complicated. It had many twists and turns, but there was lots of hurt and lots of love, and lots of respect, and they are, uh, you know, an inescapable teamwork between the two of them. So, there's definitely that between the two. Some characters I want you to remember that kind of romantic characters are going to come in and out of their lives. For Franklin, remember Lucy Mercer and Missy Lahand. And then for Eleanor, remember Joseph Lash, Earl Miller, Dr. David Gurowich. I know I was going to get it wrong. Dr. David Gurowich. And then the person we're talking about today, writer Lorena Hickok. So we're going to talk about Eleanor and Hick. That's our couple that was doomed to fail. And we'll start with Hick. She was born on March 7th, 1893 in East Troy, Wisconsin. So terrible place to be born, terrible time to grow up. She was poor. She had a very hard Midwestern life. Her father was an abusive alcoholic. She left home at a young age to work as a maid. So very young, like 13, 14, working in other people's homes. She didn't really get a chance to go to school. Eventually, a relative in Chicago was able to take her in and allowed her to get an education. And so she began writing as like a girl reporter in in like Minneapolis, in Wisconsin, in like the, the Midwest. And, you know, it was a time when like women were given the, you know, tell me about the biggest pumpkin in town stories, you know, like it wasn't like a woman was a hard hitting reporter, but Hick was a hard hitting woman. And she... um wanted to, you know, move up and do other things and really get, move forward with her writing. And she was very talented. So Hick was also a lesbian. She had an eight-year relationship with a woman named Ella Morse, a fellow reporter. By all accounts, they were very happy. Um, Hick was diagnosed with diabetes in, you know, in her 30s. And Ella took time off to take care of her. But then unexpectedly, Ella met a man that she had once known and um, left Hick to marry him and start a family. So that sucks. Hick was devastated. You know, obviously they lived like together as like companions and friends because it was the, you know, the the thirties and forties, but she did, you know, have a long-term relationship and she moved to New York because she wanted to kind of get away from the memories of Ella and what they had together. So in 1932, where our story starts, Hick is the most popular women reporter in the country. She was the first woman to have a byline in the New York Times, and she calls herself, well, I said that I said this already, but she called herself, quote, the top gal reporter in the country. So that's awesome. Yeah. So she was really her. like top of her game. Yeah, absolutely. Just breaking down barriers. Yeah. And um, so if you want to picture her, she's stocky, you know, she's a little bit, you know, she's she's kind of short, kind of stocky. She's smoking constantly and she's drinking and telling stories. She just sounds like a blast. So she'd have this hard life. Now she's in New York. She's an associated press reporter. Things are going really well for her. So we have Hick. It's 1932. Let's go back to Eleanor. What? I just Googled Eleanor Roosevelt and Lorena Hickok to get a picture of what she looks like. And the very first thing that came up was a, um, it's incredible. It's it's a book that's entitled Empty Without You. Mm. I can see why this hits <laughs> you. And everyone. I mean, it's like a heartstring story. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But so now you see their pictures. Like Eleanor is tall and Hick is like a lot shorter than her. Yep. As you can kind of see them together. Yeah. And so... Eleanor Roosevelt was born Anna Eleanor Roosevelt on October 11th, 1884. So she's nine years older than Hick. She was born to a rich family. Her mother wasn't very nice to her, but she adored her father. Unfortunately, her father was a severe alcoholic and he passed away when she was young. So that's something that they actually have in common, losing their parents when they're young. Uh, Eleanor's mother died pretty quickly after that. So she was raised by family and sent to London to study at Allenswood Academy, which is a was a girls' school in London in that time. And if you look it up, it's like this beautiful old building and they knocked it down to make projects, which is gross. So like a great job, London. But 
it was run by a woman named Marie Servest, and she was from France, and she was very forward-thinking, and she was also a lesbian. So Eleanor would travel with Madame Servest all over, all over Europe, and there was another book that came out later that another student wrote about like actually being madly in love with this teacher and with this um, head, like, headmaster of the school. So Eleanor was around lesbians and like knew about these relationships from you know in her teens which I think is interesting because it was like the 20s. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would imagine I'm a, in any uh, culture, I would imagine that there's a um, the ability if you want to learn to go and find out about stuff like right, that. Right, you're right. There's always been gay people. Yeah, yeah exactly. So we've lost it around. Absolutely, totally, totally right. So um, so Eleanor you know, has a great time there and then she comes back to New York to like have her coming out party. She's obviously from a rich family because she was a Roosevelt and she ends up marrying Franklin Roosevelt, who was her father's fifth cousin. So they're like practically strangers. They're not related. They're from different branches of the Roosevelt family. They just happen to have the same last name. Right. Yeah. Her uncle is Teddy Roosevelt. So her dad okay. is Teddy Roosevelt's brother. And TR does give her away at her wedding because her dad had already passed. So she is close to him. So she's already like been to the White House, you know, and like been around the presidency because her uncle was president right so she's married to franklin um he's also just kind of like a rich kid i wish i could do like an accent that that, that they can do but they're just like you know rich kids from upstate new york and eleanor spent her 20s having babies she has six children one died um as an infant and she was a terrible mother which i also think is is interesting because like i'm when i'm reading about like first ladies and women who are really successful there's always something that gives and like eleanor Roosevelt was just not a good mom she didn't really care makes her human i mean everything else yeah. she said she sounds incredibly privileged and it's like okay well you got a flaw somewhere yeah and i think it's because she had no examples because like her mom was very mean to her but she would do things like if her daughter was crying she just like put her outside on the terrace in new york city like whatever and then the neighbors would complain she'd be like oh i thought she needed light you know like i don't know i don't know what to do with this child so she had a really, pretty bad relationship with her kids their whole lives and you know, some of her, some of her sons, you know, did go to World War II, but they, they all came back, but her kids had, like, also terrible relationships, so her, of her five children, there were, like, 15 marriages among, among them. They all got married, like, a ton of times, <laughs> so she was always, like, a little disappointed in that, but she was never really that close to them. Um, okay, that was an um, I apologize for it. I think I'm doing okay. Let me know. You're Make, great. like, jazz hands if I start doing too many ums. <laughs> I can see you. So, Okay, so now we're in 1913. Franklin is, is assistant secretary of the Navy, which is a job that TR had as well. And they lived in DC. And a woman named Lucy Mercer, who we heard about before, was one of Eleanor's secretaries. And her and Franklin had an affair. There was like a little bit of like flirtation between them. And then Eleanor found some love letters and that confirmed it. And she was, she was obviously devastated and thought her marriage was over. But her mother-in-law and FDR convinced her that, you know, they could work through it and, you know, they would be able to, you know, be, um, be okay. I said, um, so this is when it's 1921 and the big thing happens to FDR. Can you think of the big thing that might've happened to FDR when he was younger, like in his thirties? Yeah. He was stricken by his, his polio, right? Right. Correct. Yep. And in 1921, they're at Campobello, which is a house that they have in Canada. They have a bunch of like vacation houses. And he goes swimming one night with the kids, comes home, wakes up, says, I have some chills. And then he never walks again. He got polio somehow from swimming. I don't know. I didn't look that up. But that's the, kind of the story that that happens. And another question that I have for you, Farz, as a Texan. Did you know that Greg Abbott is in a wheelchair? Yeah. I didn't know that until very recently. And... I thought that was interesting because both my husband and my father-in-law were, were talking about Franklin Roosevelt for Christmas, of course, and they were like, you couldn't be president in a wheelchair today. They both said the same thing, but I'm like, yeah, you could. Greg Abbott is doing tons of damage and being such a dick in, from a wheelchair, you know? Like, I don't think that that really matters. Like, I didn't know for a long time until I saw a picture of him, but, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like the lead in his story. So I don't think it would, it would no. be for anyone now. Well, I, I would say that from what I can gather from seeing you know, news articles about him, they kind of make it a point to not show yeah. the wheelchair as much as they possibly can. Apparently, it was a pretty traumatic thing. It wasn't like he was born. No, without... it was a car accident, right? Oh, no, a tree fell on him when he was jogging. A yeah, a tree fell on him when he was jogging. Oh, that's awful. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. 
but I think it's interesting that you can still, you know, be in, be in American politics and be in a wheelchair these days. It's not like a deal breaker. Like I feel like we're told it was a deal breaker when we were little or yeah. the well, American president or something. Yeah. Well, the way that they constantly hid Roosevelt. Um, right. So nobody could see that he was in a wheelchair, which is very, very, totally. I don't think that'd be a thing anymore, thankfully. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're not like propping him up against other people, like having him pretend to walk around. Right. Yeah. We definitely did that with Franklin for sure. So this was like obviously devastating and some people wanted him to just like retire and like become, you know, just like live with his family forever. He really wanted to continue to be in politics. So for about nine years, Eleanor was his eyes and ears around the country. She would travel. She would tell him what was going on in the state and in the country. She would meet people. She worked really close with his um, advisor, Louis Howe, and kept the Roosevelt name out there. And this was really cool for her. She hadn't lived her own life for so long. She had just been a mom and had a bunch of babies and her mother-in-law was very controlling. She was under Franklin's shadow, but now she was the one who had to be out there because Franklin physically couldn't be. He spent time in Warm Springs, Georgia, where he had a spa, like healing waters that he had you know, purchased and made for, for people who were afflicted and trying to like get himself better. But while he was doing that, Eleanor was the one who was out there really doing things like writing and talking to people. And so I think that like the affair and the polio gave her two big things that really changed her life. It gave her a pass to have very deep emotional relationships with a lot of people. So now she was like, oh, I can go and have my own relationships and like live my own life. And then it also gave her a sense of non-permanence for relationships, like for marriage, for other relationships. So she did some weird things where she like held on too tight and put herself in relationships where she didn't belong because I don't think that that like sanctity of a permanent relationship meant anything as much as it did before to her. And Susan Quinn in Eleanor and Hicks, she describes Eleanor's relationships as triangular. There's always someone else involved. You know, it was always like a wife or a partner or like something. She's always kind and, of like in other people's things. Business. And Franklin's affair was the trigger for that. I think so. Yeah. yeah. And then the polio, because the polio made her kind of be able to step up and do things yep. that she wasn't able to do before. And she felt the freedom to do it because she was like, well, now I can do whatever I want, which right. was exciting for her and kind of lets her go and do her own, do her own things. So she starts a school in New York City. She's like the vice principal and teaches there with some of her friends. She starts a furniture company up in Hyde Park with her friends, Nancy Cook and Marion Dickerman, which is another lesbian couple that she was close with. So they lived on their property in Hyde Park and had a furniture factory for you know decades. So there's a lot of photos of her with them. And so she was really like, she would have an apartment in New York City where she would go to like to the village and hang out with the gays, things like that. So she was definitely like still in that community. And that had to be so Franklin, fun. Oh my God, so fun. Back to the smoking. I mean, she didn't, Eller didn't like to smoke or drink because she had that alcoholism in her family and all of that, which is why she would lock the cabinet and not want her husband to drink during prohibition. But it still sounds real fun. Yeah, because that, that was, um, that was, free stone wall mm-hmm. so a lot of the interactions had this kind of like not equality to the to it because you had to be in private it had to be it was yeah. like speakeasies and like getting together at friends houses because you weren't allowed to congregate legally yeah mm-hmm. kind of wild we talked about speakeasies last time too i love it i love it I love yeah it. i know they're played out but i love them and so FDR is elected president in 1932, blah, blah, blah. A whole bunch of stuff happened to get him there, but he's president. Do you know how many times he was president, Cars? He was three. Uh, he got elected three times and died halfway through his third term. And that's when Truman took over. Is that right? Close. It's four times. Damn. Was I right about yeah. Truman? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, when, this is not in my notes, but when FDR died, Eleanor was the one to tell Truman and Truman said, is there anything I can do for you? And she said, Oh no, no. Is there anything I can do for you? You're the one who's in trouble now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bad time um, to be a, the, an incoming president. Yeah. He didn't even make it a year into his fourth term. It, but after that, they did make it a rule. The two term rule was more of a guideline after Washington had, you know, resigned after two terms, but it's an official rule now, but the America, you know, wanted Franklin Roosevelt to get them through that war. So it was a lot. He- and there's so much. Yeah. Yeah, because he got them through, if I remember my American history right, Herbert Hoover was president during the uh, Great Depression, mm-hmm, and he basically mm-hmm. didn't do jack shit, and right. then Franklin, is, that's the position on which Franklin Roosevelt got elected, right, was I'm going to mm-hmm. fix the economy, he 
start all these different uh, associations and organizations that could hire people for day labor work and stuff like that. Yep. And yeah, it got America out of the Great Depression. Yeah, exactly. That was the New Deal. You know, a lot of like social programs, you know, let's build yep. build all these big roads, build all these big post offices, just like get, get people back to work. And um, also, this is not in my notes, just a thing that I happen to know, is like, this is the time when like, he really wanted like universal health care. He his his administration is, is responsible for unemployment benefits and social security and you know things like that that america didn't have before this so really trying to like make sure that people were supported by the government Very so cool. okay so it's his first term as 1932 and this is like the shortest i can make this and hick is assigned to eleanor as her like ap reporter so it's 1932 hick is at the top of her game she's like the best gal reporter in the country she's assigned to eleanor she's 39 years old and she's not even going to make it a year before she leaves her job so she's top of her game she doesn't even make it to the summer of 1933 she has to quit because she's so close to eleanor so it probably starts in a train car on the campaign trail they kind of were avoiding each other they like didn't you know Eleanor was like oh another reporter who's like following me around and then there was an instance where one reporter named John got invited to a Eleanor a Roosevelt family party and Hick was like that's weird I want to go too and Eleanor let her come it happened to be because John was having an affair with Eleanor's daughter Anna like the kids had terrible relationships too but they started to become friends and they spent this overnight ride in a train car where they told each other their life stories and they had so much in common like they didn't have parents who were there for them and they felt inadequate and all these things even though they were totally different socioeconomic points they still felt you know very very um you know very similar so one thing that I find one story that I think is is hilarious is in her book in this I remember Eleanor says you know Hick interviewed her the night of the inauguration and so many people were trying to interrupt them that they had to finish the interview in the bathroom of the hotel they were staying in in DC and it was innocent enough and you know in Eleanor's story she brings that up but I read another book that was like they were already in love at this point and it was inauguration night and Eleanor was overwhelmed she didn't know if she wanted to be a first lady and her and Hick kind of escaped into the bathroom and I imagine that this is like it's cold outside, you know, when you're in DC, the, the heater is like hissing, you know, so yeah. it's like the hissing from the heater is cold outside. They're sitting on the cold tile floor and they're just like, they have each other during this really crazy time. So it actually feels much more romantic than obviously than Eleanor said in her book, but it's a time when they really like work together and really needed each other. And, you know, Hick helped AR's career. He, she encouraged her to host press conferences for just women. And she also wrote to they wrote letters every day like 10 page letters to each other every day when they were apart which is crazy and hick said you know you should tell people what's going on in your letters so eleanor created a newspaper column called my day where every single day for decades she would write a couple paragraphs at what she did and it would be published in a bunch of different newspapers took which is pretty cool hick was responsible for that so these are all these letters. So we're going to go out of the timeline and think about these like love letters. So they're literally, you know, written on paper. There's thousands of pages of love, of love letters. Hick burned some of the more intimate ones um, after Eleanor died, which is a bummer. So we don't have those. And then she kind of gave up because it was like a big task. So she gave them to the museum in Hyde Park and said, don't open these until 10 years after I die. Wow. So she just like wanted them to be, to remain kind of like a secret. Yeah, and that's... Yeah. Part of what I saw here when I was trying to find this picture and found this incredibly touching title of this book called Empty Without You mm -hmm. was that I was I was looking at when Hicks died and looking at when all these rumors started coming up. And I was like, wow, that's weird. Ten years, huh? That's how long it took for people to start caring about this. It makes sense now. Yes. Oh, exactly. That's a good, good job. That's exactly why, because they weren't allowed to open them. I mean, they were could do whatever they want, whatever, but they respected her wishes and didn't do that. So unfortunately, this prude of an author named Doris Farber who wrote Hicks biography is the one who, who opened them first and she sucks and she immediately wanted to put them away it was like the 80s and she was like nope no and she said quote how could any reasonably perceptive adult deny that these were love letters so she was like floored that like Eleanor Roosevelt would have like a physical lesbian relationship with another woman while she was first lady and she wanted them put away 
she asks them to, to put them back for a couple more decades. And she also tries to get around it by saying, you know, in Victorian times, people sent more love letters to platonic friends. So you maybe have more flowery, flowery language, you know, which I think is great. We should bring that back. You know, like I, there's some letters from Ted Roosevelt and Taft where they're like, you are the best. I'm so excited that we're friends. That's great. We yeah. should do more of that, you know. I'm into but, it. Yeah. And there's more also like, you know how people are like, Abe Lincoln's gay because he slept with dudes in the same bed. Do you remember the, those rumors? I've never heard of that. So there's like, in like some of his memoirs, he's like, oh, well, I was traveling around Illinois as a circuit lawyer. And, you know, my buddy, Jeff, who's also a lawyer, we shared a room, blah, blah, blah. But that was just like what you did then because rooms were expensive. And I think the actual scandal there is how gross that must have been. Yeah. <laughs> that was not like clean sheets. That was very stinky. Anthony. All I know is what I learned about Abraham Lincoln in that Vampire Slayer movie. Do you remember that? Oh my God, I watched half of it I feel like semi-recently and I was like, I, even I can't finish this. <laughs> <laughs> it was so fun. I loved it. <laughs> Maybe I'll pick it up again, but I was like, absolutely not. So who, so who knows? You know, like, yes, people wrote more flowery letters, but let me read you some of these letters as far as. So Eleanor wore a ring that Hick gave her to the, to the first inauguration of FGR. So this is like a few months into the relationship. And she wrote to Hick, quote, Hick, darling, I want to put my arms around you to hold you close. Your ring is a great comfort. I look at it and I think she does love me. And then she says, you have grown so much to be a part of my life that is empty without you. Even though I'm busy every minute, my love enfolds thee all night through. I mean, it's incredible. those are love letters. That's where that name comes from, empty without you. Yeah. And one from Hick, this one's my favorite. So Hick wrote, that she is trying to remember Eleanor's face when they're apart. And she says, most clearly, I remember your eyes with a kind of teasing smile in them and the feeling of that soft spot just northeast of the corner of your mouth against my lips. So I think it's Blanche Wiesencook in her book where she put, she wrote, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, but the northeast corner of your mouth is always the northeast corner of your mouth. <laughs> so like, I love that. They definitely, you know, were, you know, were physical with each other. They traveled a lot in search of time alone. They drive through town by themselves and refuse secret service help. And Eleanor freely writes about them camping together and sharing rooms at friends' houses. They did some, you know, domestic work together. They went to Puerto Rico to look at the slums. It was like, and some of her pet projects sort of help people. There was a project that Eleanor did called Arthurdale, where she, um, you know, gave people houses and job training to try to get them to, you know, live better lives in like the coal mining towns. So a lot of like social services things that they did. And, you know, tons of my, darl my darlings, I miss you. And I love you on the side. They dreamed about growing old together. Like, I can't wait until we have a house together and we can just live there until we're old. Things like that. Oh. Um, they were lovely. Lovely yeah. love letters. And at this time, it was getting really hard for, obviously, Hick is not a, cannot be a, an unbiased reporter anymore. So she uh, leaves her job and, you know, starts to get jobs sort of in the government that Eleanor um, hooks, like, hooks up for her, she's able to have. I also read on Wikipedia, and I was just like scanning it for dates. Do you ever see the, the J. Edgar movie with Leonardo DiCaprio? Yes. I remember, I don't, I don't remember. It was a long time ago when I saw it, but it does, did say in Wikipedia that that movie alludes that J. Edgar had proof that Eleanor was having this lesbian affair and he threatened to expose her. But in I, don't, end, yeah, I don't remember that. I don't either, but that it was said it was alluded to in the movie, but I don't know if I want to watch it again because I feel like it was also pretty intense. Right? I remember, I remember it, I definitely didn't walk away from it thinking better of J. Edgar Hoover. No, I mean, of all people, he obviously has secrets himself. You know, of all people, yes. Yeah, like great. You're gonna you're gonna be the one to be like this is this is exposable, but whatever. He didn't, um, and so uh, Hick was you know working with Hick worked for the World's Fair. She worked for the DNC. She traveled around, reported back to Eleanor. Kind of became her eyes and ears, and eventually she moves into the White House. And I have, oh gosh, where do I have somewhere in one of these books? I have a map, like a floor plan of the White House at that time, and. So the way that it was is the 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 residence floor of the White House, Eleanor and Franklin had different rooms that were side by side, and then across a like a sitting room from Eleanor's room was the Lincoln bedroom, which is like the famous bedroom because Lincoln has a long bed there or whatever, and 
on the side of the Lincoln bedroom is a small room and that was Hicks room and she lived there for years. So wow. they were steps away from each other in the White House. Is that, that's not normal for, no. is that normal? No. Yeah, okay. So the Roosevelt's had a lot of like friends that would stop by and stay there who were like, you know, who, who would work there and they was, people would stay for a while. There were always guests, you know, it was never like an empty, you know, an empty place, but, you know, having Hick live there for so long and also they kept it a secret. So Hick would literally, like, if someone took her out to dinner, they'd bring her back to the Mayflower Hotel, and she would sneak out the back and take a cab to the White House. So, oh, that's so interesting. She wasn't telling people that she was living there, but she was living there, which I think is really, this is like, this is a sad life of Loretta Hickok, because she, you know, was, just wanted to be close to Eleanor in any way possible. I'm looking at the Mayflower to see where it is in proximity to the White House. Oh my god, thank you. So it is, I mean, it's not an inconsequential distance away, but I, I guess if you're trying to maintain that level of secret, you kind of go to whatever lengths you have to. It's yeah. kind of like, I've walked but, this, I mean, yeah, like she could have gotten dropped off way closer. There's places that, well, it would, it, would, it was a long time ago, so maybe maybe not, but maybe this, maybe this was the closest place she could have gotten dropped off at. So, yeah maybe makes sense but you're but yeah you're right she had to like pay for a cab to take her there you know it wasn't like free it's like yeah. walk across the street you know yeah so i think that's like that's more i think more evidence that you know it was it was kind of a clandestine thing that they were that, that they were doing and they were sharing so eventually you know when things got really busy eleanor was so beloved and so needed and it was world war ii you know like they really needed her out like in the world she was really working hard to get the united nations started and she often had to break plans with hick and hick was getting sicker with her diabetes and they kept disappointing each other you know yeah. being like i wish i could be here with you i can't like i have to like i'm sick i have a job i have to do this and they just kept missing each other in in this time and so unfortunately hick is just like I can't do this anymore. And she moves to a small house on Long Island that she lives in until she can no longer afford it years later. And then after that, Eleanor helps her get a place near her in Hyde Park. So she always lives near her. It's like, she was never out of reach. You know, even after the affair maybe had pulled, yeah. she was never out of reach. And they both had other relationships. Hick tried to make it work with other women. Eleanor had, a, like I said before, a disposition to like kind of be involved in other people's relationships in like a suspicious way. She would meet like younger men at like, like, I don't know, I feel like I saw that and it sounded weirder than, than I actually think it is, but she would like go to like a youth conference and she met this man, Joseph Lash, she wrote this long book about her and became a lifelong friend, but they were like very close. So it was a little bit like her sons were kind of sucked. So she needed like a son figure, but also it was a little bit like flirtatious. Yeah. And she was like get getting it. older. Yeah. And um, she also had a bodyguard named Earl Miller and he, they would do things like put on plays at the white house and like they have this like a video that they have of them doing like a pirate show where he's a pirate and he like kidnaps her and he picks her up and he's like carrying her around the white house and so there were a lot of rumors that they were having an affair and earl miller said he got married at least twice to kind of start to quell those rumors and his third divorce the wife threatened to name eleanor roosevelt in the divorce proceedings but ended up not doing it oh wow so it was like she either like significant yeah. She played a significant role there. Yeah, for sure. Like, if you're causing your friend to have three divorces because <laughs> his yeah. wives are sick of you guys hanging out, then, like, that's the thing. Also. Yeah, totally. So she was in and out of those things. In the end, her one of her last relationships was with a um, a man named Dr. David Gverevich. He, you know, was a lot, like, a lot younger than her, and then he met someone. And when he met someone, Eleanor was devastated, but ended up like letting them get married in her apartment and like traveling the world with them. So she just like didn't want to leave him alone, which is like kind of kind of weird. So he's to explore got, in different times, <laughs> he's got to pull the ripcord. That's on yes. him. Mm -hmm, totally, totally. So she just needed to be a part of relationships in, in any kind of way. Franklin also had other relationships, so he's still here. You know, he's president. His secretary, Missy Lahand, who's, who's one of the people I mentioned earlier, she devoted her goddamn life to him. She gave him everything. She was always with him. There's a couple, like the Hyde Park movie with Bill Murray. Have you seen that? No. Maybe. So there's a movie where Bill Murray plays FDR, and it, they do the weekend where the King and Queen of England come to Hyde Park to, to, to meet with him. And 
they, they in that movie they flat out say that he was having an affair with like another cousin of his and Missy Lehand, his secretary. Um, the weird thing that I think is also kind of interesting about the way that the Roosevelts think about relationships is that Missy Lehand was fucking devoted to Franklin. She was always with him. She helped him with everything. And when she like she had a heart attack or a stroke, went to the hospital, he never visited her. And when she died, he didn't go to her funeral. Oh wow! So he just like forgot about her in like a in like that fleeting relationship kind of way, which I think is is really sad. And her life is sad, but. Like we said before, Franklin was president four times. He died during his fourth term, pretty early into his fourth term. He was in Warm Springs, Georgia. And guess who he was with when he died? Eleanor? No, he's with Lucy Mercer, the girl, the uh, woman that he had the affair with 20 years ago, like 20 oh, wow. to 30 years ago that started the whole thing. They had started to see each other again. And Eleanor's daughter, Anna, had, had kind of helped arranged that because they loved each other and Anna saw that Lucy made her dad happy when her dad was like super stressed out and her mom never made him happy that way you know well, they hadn't in a long time even though the, the, the Roosevelt's loved each other they still didn't have that like it just was you know different so after FDR dies Eleanor is you know out on her own um, Hick writes some books for young adults. She wrote a book on Helen Keller and Eleanor actually arranged for her to meet Helen Keller. So that book is like still up there and was pretty popular. Eleanor was in her late 60s and early 70s and she was still traveling the world. So she was working for the United Nations under Truman and then Eisenhower took away her actual job with the UN, but she volunteered with it after that. And so she went everywhere. She went to Russia, the Middle East, Asia, just all over the world into her into her 70s. And she would visit Hick in her small apartment in Hyde Park near the Roosevelt home from time to time. And Hick was very sick with her diabetes. She had arthritis. She couldn't see very well. So she really couldn't go anywhere. She just kind of stayed like near Eleanor's home for the end. Yeah. And um Eventually, Eleanor got sick with tuberculosis. One fun thing is in the hospital, she was like, okay, I'm ready to die. And the nurse said, you should wait until God is ready for you. And ER said, utter nonsense, which is cute, a cute thing to say. And she ended up being able to go home and she died in New York in, on November 7th, 1962 at the age of 78. Eleanor is buried with Franklin in Hyde Park. So obviously this was devastating for like a lot of people. She was like the first lady of the world. Everybody really loved her, um, obviously Hick especially. And although she was very sick, she lived another five years. And during that five years, she did more writing and kind of put it around the town next to where, where Eleanor was buried. And during this time, this is when she, you know, she curated her letters and donated them to the museum and all of those things. And Hick died on May 1st, 1968. In her will, she gave um, her favorite granddaughter of Eleanor's the royalties to her Helen Keller book, and they've amounted to like, you know, over $80,000. So she was able to, you know, finally give someone some money and earn some money from her writing. And she put in her will that she wanted to be cremated and have her ashes scattered by, you know, a tree to help the trees grow. But her ashes went unclaimed and they were buried in the mass unclaimed remains plot in the Rhinebeck Cemetery about 15 minutes from Hyde Park, which sucks. Yeah. And so later, after the letters came out and after people started learning more about Hick and Eleanor's relationship, ER's biographer and some other women would plant a tree in the cemetery um, and put a little bench and they made a little plaque and the plaque says, I'm going to cry now, the plaque says, Lorena Hickok Hick, March 1893 to May 1968, East Troy, Wisconsin to Hyde Park, New York, AP reporter, author, activist, and friend of ER. Aww. And that's where her little packets come to And I'm crying because it's just, it's very passionate and interesting. And it's, like I said before, like it's a, I think Eleanor had her full life and I don't think that Hick did. And so that makes me really, really sad. This is the worst episode of a podcast ever. It was sad and it was traumatizing and I'm sorry to everyone. <laughs> no, I think it's hitting for me so many feelings mm -hmm. I'm being honest you know I've I've uh the impetus for this podcast which I don't know if we've even discussed here was a relationship that I was in that was very I'm going to describe as soulful that was obviously going to it had to end. Yeah. And there's a quality to your story that <laughs> really hit home mm -hmm. for me 
when it comes to that, which is the universe putting two people together in mm-hmm. moments when they really, really, really need each other. Knowing full well that those circumstances that also brought you together are the circumstances that are going to tear you apart. Yeah, totally. Which is sad. Yeah, I, oh, it is sad, but I think it's, it's sad and that it's hopeful because then you can, you know, you can live many lives and have many, you know, just don't, kill people just love a lot of people and i feel like that you know that's what eleanor did and hick i think you know fortunately unfortunately she had her great love and it was eleanor so yeah it was that was that was that was kind of it for her and i'm happy that we're telling her story in you know many different books in many different ways because it's such an important part of part of history to be like you know this this relationship during this time and you know the doris kieran's goodwin book is called um it's called no no ordinary time because that's what we're talking about. Like this was a real special time in history and a real special like a relationship and, and thing for the entire world. And that during this time there was love as well. It's it's like I think really hopeful and sad and interesting. And next week I'm gonna do something horrible. I need to find something that is like very violent again. I'm gonna get more violence into mine. <laughs> you know what what I was also thinking of was um Diana. Yeah. Because, I mean, obviously their husbands were dramatically different. Franklin was arguably the best president the U.S. Mm-hmm. has ever had. Charles was useless and didn't do anything. But, like, they both ended up in some ways becoming kind of the flag bearer mm-hmm. for their husbands and their countries. And, mm-hmm. yeah, very interesting. Becoming their own powerhouse independent of their husbands, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I don't feel like I'm going to do Diana because she's been done to death part of the pun. But there's so many freaking things about her. Leave her alone. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I'm going to let her let her rest for a minute and a half. Um, that poor lady. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, thanks, <gasps> Taylor. Um, I am, you know, I, I'm going to dwell on this. I'm actually leaving after this to drive to Dallas for <laughs> a family reunion. And there's going to be two things that I'm you left me with that I'm legit going to be dwelling on the entire drive. One is the concept of living the shit out of your life, mm-hmm. which I think I've been sleepwalking through most of that for yeah. a little bit. And I'm coming out of it. And this story really helped reinvigorate that piece. And the other is, I'm never going to forget this title, Empty Without You, The Intimate Letters of Lorena Hickok and Eleanor Roosevelt. I don't even what have a, that book. I don't think I could handle it emotionally. What a beautifully <laughs> titled book. Mm-hmm. And when you read that quote, I was like, oh, they talk to each other like this. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's so beautiful and so lovely. And I, I'll write you a really nice letter later today that tells you that you're the best. I appreciate that. You are not going to like this because I don't. I, I know no. you well enough to know that you are not a huge fan of Ronald Reagan. But... <laughs> I did go to Reagan's uh, presidential museum when I was living in LA. That's cool. His love letters to Nancy were like this. They were are they really incredible? And, and they're they're all over the place. You just go back, go around and read them because he was always on the move, you know, mm-hmm. doing his thing. But he wrote incredible letters to to his wife, and they're cool. they're definitely worth a read. I definitely so. want to go. I want to go to all of the, the presidential museums. His has an Air Force One too, right? Yeah, Isn't but it's like the old. No, like, no, I know. But yeah, yeah. is it cool? It's on the 747. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Uh, it, they have Air Force One, they have Marine One. You walk into this giant hangar that has a cafe, and it's, it's, oh. and it's, I'm trying to remember what city it's in in California. I can't remember. Wherever it is, though, it faces this bluff mm-hmm. that is, stunning you ha- you're in this hangar that's all glass based like on the side cool. of a cliff it's absolutely fantastic i need to go nixon's library is also very close to here too and i just find it delightful that nixon's from costa mesa because i imagine him like with an umbrella and it's raining on just him because he's like from <laughs> this beautiful place in california he's just like Mah. um and also my i'm going to new york in july and i will be 35 minutes from hyde park so i will report back because i'm going to go visit that i'm going to visit lorena's plaque i'm going to cry a lot um I will awesome. share photos when I do that later. Please so do. cool. Well, thank you, Fars, for this. Have a safe trip to Dallas. 
um, while you're there, go to the JFK um, Museum about the assassination. There's there's a place where you can go and stand at the window that Lee Harvey Oswald oh, yeah. was at. You can do that. And uh, I want to remind everyone to like and subscribe on all the things. Find us at Doomed to Fill Pod on Facebook and, and Instagram. And keep listening. Thank you. Keep listening. We'll leave you with keep listening. Thanks, Taylor. I'll be funnier. I keep saying that. I don't get funnier. I'm going to go cry. I'm going to weep. I'll talk to you later. (laughs) I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.